grateful for everyone's presence tonight in this uh, second service on the Lord's Day. This was listed in the slide that goes out on Facebook late in the week and then sent with the bulletin. The lesson for tonight is Calvinism Exposed. And so we want to spend just a little bit of time tonight thinking through the false teachings of Calvinism. And so as we think about looking at a false doctrine, you know, this morning in our class we're reviewing some things regarding restoration and going back to the true doctrine of Jesus Christ and being a Christian and all that that entails. And certainly in doing that, we have to encounter some of the false teachings that are in the world and in the religious world. And part of going back to the original is recognizing those things that aren't right, dealing with them, setting them aside, and taking the doctrine of Jesus Christ uh, into our belief system. But tonight, as we think about Calvinism exposed, we know that many of the fundamental concepts of John Calvin existed long before he came along. And as we're going to notice in our lesson tonight, we're going to do just a brief summary of the five main points that someone came up with at some point with the acronym TULIP uh, as a way of remembering. And we'll look at those in just a few moments. If you notice at the time in which he lived, he was born in 1509 and he died in 1564. By the age of 27, he wrote uh, the volumes that are titled The Institutes of the Christian Religion. He had a tremendous influence in his own time on the religious world. And of course, look at what we're doing tonight. We're talking about him tonight in a lesson uh, exposing the false teaching that he helped to develop. It wasn't all original with him. We know that Augustine uh, had things long before him that Calvin borrowed and brought forward. And then he contributed to those things on his own and, and picked up other things from some other people as well. But John Calvin was a 16th century Swiss reformer. And, you know, we've talked about the Reformation. And we've contrasted that with the Restoration. And whenever we talk about the Reformation, we know that they didn't go back far enough. They didn't go all the way back to Acts 2 in the New Testament, to the New Testament church. But these, a lot of those individuals were trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And they didn't go far enough. And so they would get so far and for whatever, there were a lot of different things happening at the time. And many of them faced persecution. Many of them were forced to stop doing what they were doing. And sadly, there were those who they influenced that followed them that would start a church. Or they would start a movement in that person's name. And so whenever you look at the Protestant denominational world, you can trace most all of that back to this time period when many of them, including Calvin, had such an influence on people that they took his doctrines, his views, and they went and they would go and establish uh, what we call denominational churches, man-made churches. But if you look at the points, as we will tonight briefly, regarding Calvinism and some of the specific doctrines, you find these in, in most denominational churches some way. There's some form of these. And as any teaching over time, any man-made teaching, what happens? It gets reformed, doesn't it? It gets changed. And so it's hard to quote exact things sometimes that they all believe because there's going to be some that will say, well, I believe in Calvinism, but I maybe don't believe in this particular point that you've made. Well, that's true because people change their minds. People change their views and their doctrines in the denominational world. And so we're going to just kind of give an overview of these things tonight in general. But the point is also that these things, these teachings of Calvin heavily influence the denominational world. And so you and I, as we go out and we try to talk to someone about the church, we try to talk to them about Jesus and salvation it's not long before we run into one of these. And this is what they believe. And so then we have to try to work through that with them. And we need to go to the Scripture and be able to show them that, you know, your view of this is, here's where you get that view. It's from Calvin or some man or a denominational teaching. But here's what God says. And so God is very clear in His Word, as we know, on, on the points of salvation and the things that 
surround our salvation. And so we want to study some of this tonight. Another familiar name is Martin Luther, and Calvin was uh, somewhat a protege of Martin Luther. And so they were very influential, again, in the 1500s and the Reformation. Martin Luther, one of the greatest errors that he ever uh, promoted was the saved by faith alone. We run into that often. And that's where people just think, well, you can say the sinner's prayer or you can make this little statement that we have written on this card or in this book or in this discipline and then you'll be saved. And they don't talk about the fact that, well, repentance is necessary, confessing the name of Christ is, and certainly being baptized into Christ, but they try to say you're saved at the point of just believing in your mind. And we'll notice that in a few moments too. But as we look at this uh, acronym of TULIP, and we see total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. It's a chain of false reasoning, and we have to recognize it as what it is. And so it stands opposed to Bible teaching, and as we'll see in it, it's, you know, it's a corruption of different passages of Scripture under these different points. And so as we begin to think about this tonight, Let's think about total depravity. And so in the words of a Calvinist, they would say regarding this, and this simply is meaning we're born in sin. And so they say man, since the fall in the garden, has inherited the sin of Adam down through the ages. And being born with Adam's sin is totally depraved. That is, man is totally incapable of any good thing whether in thought or deed. Now that's a quote from one of their uh, canons, one of their writings. And so notice in there, they go back to the fall and they say, well, we all inherit Adam's sin. And they say we're born in sin. And notice the statement that we're incap totally incapable of any good thing, whether in thought or deed. And so that's a pretty depressing statement, really, when you think about it, if there's no good in anybody in that way. Certainly, we go back and we realize that's when sin entered in and the fall there in Genesis, the first three chapters, as God gives his will and as he creates and as man understands that but then disobeys. Sin comes in. Notice how total depravity or being born in sin, you know, is a false doctrine. And so think about how we're talking about being born, an infant, an innocent baby. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Even in the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, 2 and 3, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And even Jesus recognized the innocence and the trustworthiness, the, the truthfulness, you know, of a child and of a small child. In Matthew 19, beginning in verse 13, when the children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And so we're reminded, aren't we, as, as we think about being born into this world, well, there's no understanding there of right or wrong, and as we're going to see in just a moment, that's what it takes in order to commit sin, in order to transgress God's law. And so total depravity being born in sin, again, is a false doctrine. In 1 John 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And so the idea, in order, we ha in order to sin, we have to practice it. And we know that's not you know, capable uh, regarding an infant or a small child. 
In Isaiah 7 and verse 16, the first phrase there, it says, before, For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Notice the statement there. There's a process of growing and, and of learning and of developing and that God nowhere says that you're just born in sin. You're totally incapable of any good or of any value. And then notice in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, and this gives us the process of how sin comes about. James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. It's interesting for a number of reasons why you know, James would mention, do not be deceived. But he's reminding us, isn't he, how does sin come about? And he's outlined it for us. It's not God's fault. It's not God putting sin in our life or causing us to sin or stumble. But verse 14, it's upon each of us, isn't it? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Look at how we have to be old enough to be able to have that desire. We have to be old enough to be able to be lured by something uh, that's sinful, that is a temptation. Then when, that's, when desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And so we're reminded of the process. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to to endure it. Certainly there's many more points and passages we could make, but these remind us of the fact that we're born sinless, we're born innocent, pure, and sin only comes when we reach that age. As we talk about accountability and we understand, as we noted there in Isaiah 7, 16, when we fully then come to an understanding of how to choose the good, and refuse the evil, that then James 1 comes into play. And so what a, it's a very harsh doctrine, isn't it, as we think about that regarding total depravity. Second one is unconditional election. And so the idea here, as we continue on this pattern, and it's, we'll see it in a few moments a little clearer. So now God has predestined some people to be saved and some to be condemned to hell without regard to man's desires, words, or deeds. These saved ones are known as the elect. They had no choice whatsoever in being saved. Thus, the term unconditional election. And so unconditional election, God's predestined some to be saved, some to be condemned, without regard to the person's desires, their words, or their deeds. Well, think about how that takes us out of the picture in a way, doesn't it? It takes away my free will. If God has predestined, pre-chosen before the foundation of the world, the specific individuals that are going to be saved and that are going to be lost, that's another very kind of a cold doctrine, isn't it? And one that wouldn't that make God a respecter of persons? And we'll notice another point in just a moment. But in Acts 10, verse 34, beginning, Peter, as he's preaching to Cornelius and his household, he said, you know, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Sounds like the Peter's saying, you know what? Everyone is able to use their free will. The gospel is going to be open to everybody, and everybody will have, they can make up their own mind. They can decide to be, obey the gospel and be saved or reject it and be lost. 
God is no respecter of persons. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, it is stated of God and of Jesus who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if it was only the elect, why would Paul not say that? Why would Peter not say that? But only the elect could be saved. Why wouldn't he say, who desires only the elect to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? But he says, all people. And then in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing or wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's another verse, isn't it? It sounds like God, Peter, through Peter, is opening up the gospel to everybody. God wants all to, to repent. That's his desire. He wants all to be saved. And then another point. If we were pre-chosen and we had no choice in the matter and God has already predetermined who specifically will be saved before the foundation of the world, why are we commanded to preach the gospel to every creature? Why are we commanded to preach the gospel to every living individual, to every soul? Why? If it's already pre-chosen, if it's already set and doesn't matter, why does God say, why did Jesus leave us the great commission to go into all the world and preach to every soul and encourage them, motivate them, plead with them to become a Christian? And so we see how false the unconditional election is. But notice here how Calvin begins to build. So we're born in sin. Nobody is any good. Nobody's of any account at any age, basically. He says, now, God is going to save only those that he pre-chooses. Okay, well then, he comes up with the thought, well, based upon that then, Jesus only died for those that God chose before the foundation of the world, that have no choice in the matter, but only Jesus died for them. Quoting one of their uh, passages in one of their books, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was only for those predestined to eternal life. Thus, it was limited in its scope. Hence, the term limited atonement. Well, right away, you start thinking about, well, what does God say about Jesus and his death on the cross? Who did Jesus die for? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Wow, that opens up a whole nother picture, doesn't it? God says, look, Jesus came to this world, came into this life for that short time because God wanted us to be saved. The gospel, the death of Jesus, is for the whole world. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, beginning, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, Notice, who gave himself as a ransom for only the elect. No, it doesn't say that. It says, who gave himself a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 2 and verse 9, But we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. We're all familiar with those passages, aren't we? And the, and the plain teaching of God's word that Jesus died for all. He died for everyone. And the gospel is offered to everyone. It's open to all. No matter our nationality, no matter when we're living this side of the cross, the gospel is for all. And then in 1 John 2 and verse 2, Jesus, he is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he's the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And, and John said, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John was speaking 
as a true saved disciple of Jesus Christ, wasn't he? The Apostle John. He says, look, Jesus not only died for us, but he died for the sins of the whole world. And so a limited atonement falls, doesn't it? And so we see that, you know, being born in sin, that's a, that's a false concept, a false doctrine. The idea of the elect, God predetermining only the specific ones and that no one else has an opportunity to be saved, that's false according to God's word. That the idea that Jesus only died to save those elect that God pre-chose, that's a false teaching. And the Bible gives us plenty of, of points to remind us of the truth there. Then we come to irresistible grace. And so in, in their ideas, they say since we're totally depraved from birth, we're incapable of thinking, desiring, or doing any good thing, man cannot even desire to be saved by God. Thus, God must give his grace to man, and as a man is not stronger than God, he is powerless to resist God's grace. And so we see the idea. It's, it's just an unfolding in his mind of, of his way of thinking that we can be saved or whoever would be saved. And so he puts all these things together and he comes up with irresistible grace. Wouldn't we say that any gift which cannot be refused at all is really no gift at all? Because wouldn't that be coercion? If I'm going to be forced. And so the, the origin of the false doctrine of being saved by faith alone comes in here. The idea is that man, that we're, we're totally depraved, we must be forced to receive God's grace. And so God directly operates on the sinner through the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. And that can't be refused. And it can't be requested either puts man in a really strange place. It puts us in an awkward spot, doesn't it? And so we realize that this doesn't match at all with what we read about in God's Word regarding the overall plan from the very beginning for God to send Jesus, who would be the perfect Lamb of God, to save mankind. And that we would use our free will to listen to the Word, to understand it, to tr put it in our heart, to allow it to develop in a working faith, an obedient faith, and so on. But notice one of the scriptures they'll sometimes uh, say is John 6 and verse 44. And they'll use this, the first part of it, and they'll say, where the Bible says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so they'll try to use that verse to justify the idea of irresistible grace, that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. But notice the next verse, verse 45. Jesus said it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so, you read a little bit further, and God's Word is consistent all the way through, isn't it? But they try to pull out just that part of John 6, to justify their false teaching. But if we read the next verse, Jesus reminds us, even in the prophets it was written, that the gospel was going to be open for everybody. We'll all be able to be taught by God. We'll all be able to have an opportunity to hear and learn from the Father. And so the Bible teaches us that People are drawn, we're drawn to God and to the gospel and to Jesus through the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Think of uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. Paul said, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And so teaching and preaching, that's a, that's a part of that work that God has planned to get the message out. So the people can hear, all can have an opportunity to hear. In Acts 2 and verse 37, if we think about that, when they heard this, that audience, was they were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? And so think again of the openness 
of the gospel. In Acts 4 and verse 4, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And so we're getting away here. As we read these verses, we don't see anything about the chosen or the elect or only those that God pre-chose to be saved being mentioned here. That, oh, the gospel is only for you. If you're in the crowd and you, you know, have this grace that's irresistible, you know, come. That, that, that wasn't the message. But the message was open to everyone. And as Peter stated there, he said, every one of you, in Acts 2 and verse 38, every one of you was required to repent and to be baptized. In Acts 15 and verse 7, in talking there, Peter stood up and he said, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Why preach to the Gentiles? If God only had a certain few that he had already pre-chosen, why make that effort to go and to preach to another group of people? And so we go through and we find all of these things uh, in the Bible that remind us of God's plan of using teaching and preaching and persuading us, mankind, to respond and obey the gospel of Christ. And then we think about Acts 26 and verse 16. Regarding Paul, he was recounting his being called to preach by God and Jesus appearing to him. And we, he remembers he was told to rise and stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen in me and to those which I will appear to you. Why did God, why did Jesus prepare Paul to go to the world, into the world, and preach to the lost? Because they were lost. And so we see the gospel was for everyone. There wasn't a limitation. He didn't say, now don't worry about those who I've already called or I've already put in here automatically. There was no teaching about that because it's not there. But the gospel is for all. And then finally tonight, the perseverance of the saints. This is also known as once saved, always saved. It's known as the impossibility of apostasy. We talked about that this morning, falling from grace. Think about the beginning in our class this morning, if you were here, in all the verses, and we talked about just the abundance of material in just the New Testament by itself that warns us from falling away. And so the idea in their teaching is that once one is saved, once you've been chosen by God, you can't resist it. God counts you as His elect, and you are saved no matter what. The teaching of Calvin then is that you cannot now be lost ever. And so once one is saved by a direct act of God, they say he is incapable of undoing what God has done. And in their writings, they say this is a necessary conclusion to the entire process. Man had nothing to do with it to start. He can have no part after the fact. Well, what does God's Word teach? What does the Bible say? The Bible does teach that once we're saved, once we're a Christian, once we are a child of God, it is possible for us to so live or so sin and fall away from God's grace to where we're lost. And so there's a lot of teaching throughout the Bible and especially throughout the New Testament that warn us of this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul spoke and he's reminding Timothy and us as well. He said, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Paul's talking about the saved. And he says there's the, the possibility. He said, now, this, there is going to be a falling away. There's, that's definite. But then there's going to be the possibility then that some are going to depart from the faith, from being in a saved condition. Now they'll be lost because they've devoted themselves, they've given themselves to believing deceitful spirits 
and teachings of demons. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 16, there Paul said, But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Paul identifies some false teachers, doesn't he? He says, here's Hymenaeus and Philetus, and they're teaching a false truth. They're saying that the resurrection has happened already regarding the second coming. And he says they're upsetting the faith of some. And so they were saved. But now it seems that Paul has set them over here in this category. They're not teaching the truth anymore. They're not deserving of the grace of God anymore. They're outside of that. And they're going to be lost. And what about Galatians 5 and verse 4? Which is a very clear passage, isn't it? That states very clearly that we can fall from grace. Paul there, he's telling the, those in the churches of Galatia that, you know, you've gone and you've believed some false teachers. You've gone back and you're trying to be justified by the Old Testament way, by the law of Moses. And he said, you've been drawn into this and, and you're not right. You're following another gospel and it's not right. And he says, if you do this, if you think you can be saved by the law of Moses or any of the particulars of it, he said, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Can we fall away? Paul said by inspiration, yes. It's a definite possibility that we may fall away, lose our salvation, and that's very clear in the New Testament teaching. And so we want to be on guard against that, don't we? Hebrews writer in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, and also Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2 reminds us of that. And we'll finish out on 2 Peter chapter 2 tonight. He said, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Notice, he says, you're in a, you've come out of the world into Christ. But now you're being led away from Christ. And you're overcome in this false teaching. He says, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness or salvation than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So many more passages could be brought up on that last point as well, but those should be sufficient to remind us we need to be on guard as a Christian. We need to remember that every day it's a work in progress, isn't it? To, to remain faithful to God. We have to be alert. We have to study and pray and serve and worship God and honor Him with our life so that we can remain faithful because the possibility is we can be lost. As we summarize Calvinism, this is from an old um, debate book. And it's called The Curiosities of Calvinism. And it kind of ties in kind of a tongue-in-cheek statement regarding really how foolish the teachings are and how if you knock one out, they all are going to fall. But notice this statement. The idea is if you believe in Calvinism and follow it, when you get religion, you don't want it. If you want it, you haven't got it. When you want it, you can't get it. If you get it, you can't lose it. For if you lose it, you never had it. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of components there that show us just how ridiculous of a teaching it is. It, because it's of man. That's why. It's a man-made teaching. It's inconsistent. It's against the Bible's teaching regarding all of these points that we've looked at tonight and even more. And so just as a, a reminder tonight, we face these things in our community we face these things possibly in our families that are members of denominational churches who will believe this. And so hopefully there's more we can study 
on our own to brush up on these things and be ready to help someone to study their way out of them. And that's our goal, isn't it? Is to help people see the light of God's truth and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight, as we studied, we've noticed a number of different angles of salvation. We understand Jesus did die for everyone. He shed his blood that all could have an opportunity to be saved. If you're with us tonight and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to examine your life, your place, realizing that you don't have yet a relationship with God. You need one in order to be saved. If you want to go to heaven, we have to have a faithful relationship with God by our obedience to his will. As he's already sent Jesus, Jesus did his work on the cross. Jesus is still serving us. He's our intercessor. He's our great high priest. He's our advocate. He's Lord of lords. He's our king of kings. And we need to submit to him. Are you ready to do that tonight by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? If you've already done that, but maybe you need prayer, maybe you need to uh, be encouraged in some way, won't you make that known so you can strengthen your relationship with God as well as we stand and as we sing?